I want you to imagine that you're the single parent of two. It's Thursday, about 9 p.m., and you're just getting home from the second of two jobs you carry to support your family. You've picked up your kids from their grandparents and put them to bed. You sit down in your living room, go to turn on the TV, but suddenly the doorbell rings. Unusual, you think, I never get visitors at this hour. You head to the doorway, and that's when it happens. It's a bailiff, and you've been served. Before you can even open the envelope, a million scenarios come racing through your mind. Is this something for my ex? Was I laid on a student loan? Have I inherited a million dollars from a long lost relative? <laughs> if only. No, it's your landlord. You're being evicted. You have 30 days to pack up your things and find a new place. You read the notice. Not quite agreeing and worse, not quite understanding what rights you do have. This is Mary's story, but it could just as easily be yours. When I applied to law school some 15 years ago, I thought that if I was lucky, I would be the lawyer to protect the defenseless and the vulnerable. I thought that I'd play some role in reducing the inequality gap and in bringing a greater sense of justice to those for whom the law seemed totally inaccessible. But very quickly, I lost sight of that goal. I got lost. For the better of 10 years, I worked at two of the best law firms in the country, representing large corporations and wealthy business people. Fantastic salary, fancy office, the praise of my peers, the admiration of family and friends. In a sense, I had made it. But I was lost. In the back of my mind, often when my head touched the pillow after another exhausting day, I wondered how I'd lost sight of my not-so-distant dream to not only work on the best cases, but also to help those who needed me most. I'd set out to make a difference, but here I was taking the most conventional of paths. Now, for a time, I was able to appease those inner thoughts by volunteering my early mornings and late evenings to charities, foundations, nonprofits. I was even able to fit in a little bit of pro bono work of my own, thanks to some very understanding bosses. But I wondered for how long I could go on with one foot planted in my real job and the other in projects that, in my view, would help make the world a better place. I became obsessed with the endless canyon that seemed to exist between, on one side, how I earned an enviable living, and on the other, how I wanted to give back to society as much or more than what I was taking from it. Now, luckily, from that obsession grew the determination to solve a problem. How could I continue to represent clients who could afford me? while also defending individuals and organizations who didn't have the money to pay for a lawyer. I feel fortunate to be standing here today in front of you as the founder and chief executive officer of the first one-for-one -one law firm in the world. For every hour of legal services we provide to paying clients, we give back one hour of pro bono to low-income individuals, nonprofits, and early-stage entrepreneurs. We bill an hour, we give back an hour. Some call it paying it forward. I like to think of it as the way we should be doing business in the 21st century. For the earlier part of my life, I thought of making money and doing good as two mutually exclusive goals. Normal, right? When we consider the examples of entrepreneurs who were acclaimed as the most successful in modern times, their motto was simple. Make your money first, then give some of it back. 
I remember reading the biographies of two of the most revered founders of the last century. Sam Walton, who created Walmart, and Bill Gates, who started Microsoft. And I distinctly remember that these two businessmen, despite being roughly 50 years apart in age, shared two reasons for starting their businesses. The first one was passion. Passion for the core focus of their venture. For Gates, it was innovative technology. For Walton, it was providing consumer goods at the best possible price. See, companies fundamentally cannot succeed if their founders aren't all consumed by their industry, product, or service. So the notion of the passionate entrepreneur makes a lot of good sense. The second was an obvious one, profit. Gates and Walton wanted to make money thanks to some savvy business sense and some pretty good ideas. Well, we now know that they ended up making a lot of it. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that this is a bad thing. Making money to support oneself and in many cases provide for his or her family has and will likely always be an essential reason for entrepreneurship. So, we have these two key motivations that have driven entrepreneurs for just about as long as we can remember. But I guess a big part of why I'm here speaking to you today has to do with my belief that in this era, at this specific moment in history, there's now a third ingredient that's progressively being added to the recipe for entrepreneurial success. That ingredient is what we call purpose. To me, purpose has become the third reason and will soon be the third imperative why people should be starting businesses. Now, sure, I say this because of the increasing number of studies and analyses on the subject, but also because I myself run a purpose-driven business that is growing faster than I could have ever imagined. I discovered the concept of purpose while I was still waiting in the most traditional of waters, in a world where profit per partner was often the only real way to differentiate between a strong law firm and a weaker one. But outside the walls of what had become my normal, I became aware of a small movement of entrepreneurs and executives who were thinking about business differently than we had been for the past hundred years or so. That movement was gaining speed. I remember feeling so inspired to learn, for example, that Patagonia strived to use business in their outdoor clothing business as a means to solve some of society's greatest environmental problems or that Ben & Jerry's thought of itself as a social justice company that serves ice cream. Where the founders behind these companies such as these converged was in their belief that purpose shouldn't be accessory to running a business, but rather that it should be, really it's raison d'être. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that in this day and age, no one should be starting a business without, in addition to a viable economic value proposition, that business having an equally important proposition to move our society forward. That was a philosophy that I could believe in. That was a philosophy that would give me the courage to start a business of my own. And so once I realized that, I knew I had to be part of this paradigm shift. But I had to find a purpose-driven business model of my own, one that played to my strengths. So I knew that I had two things going for me. Well, apart from my dashing good looks, but <laughs> hold the applause. <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you. 
One, I was a pretty good lawyer. Two, I felt convinced that with the right idea, I could convince other talented, socially conscious lawyers to join my venture. So I thought for weeks about how I could con contribute to alleviating access to justice issues while continuing to earn a decent living. And in doing so, I realized that I had to stop treating business clients like one species and less fortunate ones like another. In the end, they were all just clients who needed a good lawyer on their side. And then I thought, I wonder how it would feel for a corporate client to know that just by choosing a law firm in particular, they'd be helping a woman on welfare or a nonprofit they believed in or a starving young entrepreneur gain access to a lawyer. What if I charged the business clients and helped the needy ones for free? That was my idea. In practice, what we'd be doing was to ditch the fancy offices and the excessive executive compensation. Basically, we'd cut out the overabundance of luxury in order to spend more of our revenue on social good. Now, not only did I think that this was the right thing to do, but I was convinced that it would make us so unique in our market that potential clients wouldn't have a choice but to take notice. And so far, I feel as though betting on purpose was the best possible move we could have made. Our firm has grown from what was initially just my co-founder Sophie and I to a team of 12 legal professionals today. Now, not only do we have several multinational corporations in our client roster, but to date, we've also helped free of charge just over 300 individuals and organizations who, without us, wouldn't have had access to a lawyer at all. And see, the thing is, where I'm standing, we're just getting started. You see, we find ourselves at a time in history when we are experiencing the greatest rates of change and innovation. The next 10 years will present more disruption than the past 50 years combined. Get this, since 2000, of the 500 Fortune 500 companies, 50% have disappeared. In the next 10 years, another 40% will become extinct. So what do we do? My answer is purpose. Beyond cutting prices while still maintaining product quality, purpose may well be the only remaining competitive advantage available to business leaders looking to find themselves on the winning side of this disruption. Companies that integrate purpose will give themselves the opportunity to succeed. Businesses that don't won't stand a fighting chance. Now, there are three main reasons for this. One, purpose-led brands are more successful in acquiring and retaining customers. Behavioral science tells us as much. People buy things that make them feel good about themselves, and people do business with brands they trust. The authentic story of purpose behind my own firm is helping us win customers every day and is critical to us winning even more. Say, just last week, when we were pitching for a potential new file, I knew we were being considered because we had the right team and our prices were fair, but I also knew this to be true of the two other firms vying for the mandate. So why did we end up on top? Well, purpose. Our client told me that 
He was choosing our firm because it aligned best with the values of social responsibility that they had. Purpose helps businesses engage the best employees. There is a growing expectation that the workplace become a place of fulfillment, satisfaction, and personal meaning above just providing a good living. So a mere nine months after we'd launched, my then startup law firm landed one of the best lawyers in the country. Danielle, a leading energy law expert, told me that he was choosing us, certainly not yet for the money, but rather for the opportunities that lied in our innovative business model. Opportunity, sure, for client attraction, but opportunity perhaps even more so for his own happiness. To Danielle, our purpose-driven model was about to disrupt one of the most conservative industries out there, and he just had to be a part of it. And let me tell you, the number of people who think like Danielle is multiplying. Three, businesses that integrate purpose are growing faster than traditional companies, and investors are taking notice. In his 2018 annual letter to CEOs, Larry Fink, the founder of BlackRock, the world's largest asset management firm, told the chief executives of the companies in which BlackRock invests the following. To ensure prosperity, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but must also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Now, this year, Mr. Fink went a step further, stating that companies that ignore purpose will simply stumble and fail. So take, for example, Unilever, where among its hundreds of brands, those which have integrated purpose directly into their model, such as Dove, Hellman's, and of course, Ben & Jerry's, are growing 30% faster than the rest of Unilever's brands. So it's no wonder that the most astute investors are taking notice. They've learned that there's no longer a trade-off to be made between financial performance and social impact. Rather, they now know that these two concepts must be intrinsically linked for companies to succeed. But I'll tell you, once the numbers were crunched, once the forecast made sense, what truly became my own personal call to action was this. The world needs purpose-driven businesses. It needs a lot of them, and more than ever, it needs them now. It needs them because of people like Mary. When Mary needed legal services, she found herself being too poor to be able to pay for a lawyer, and yet too rich to be eligible to governmental legal aid. And you know who was there to help Mary? A purpose-driven company, ours. Mary had the good sense to Google pro bono lawyer Montreal, and she landed on our website. She filled out our application for free legal services, and within 48 hours had proper representation. As the story goes, a lawyer from our law firm responded to Mary's eviction notice with a solid statement of defense and won her battle before the rental board. Now, Mary's story is just one among many, whether it be in assisting a sexual assault victim seek justice, or a nonprofit recover insurance money after a terrible flood. Every day, lawyers at our firm have the opportunity to do good while earning a good living. But the social impact that our firm provides is directly proportional to our economic success. The more paying corporate clients retain our lawyers, the more these same lawyers 
can help the most vulnerable individuals and organizations of society. So consider this. In 2017, the two largest law firms in the world each generated just over $2.1 billion in revenue. Our firm, by comparison, will reach a million dollars for the first time this year while providing 3,000 hours of free legal services. Now, I'm not saying that every firm out there should be allocating 50% of its time to pro bono like we do, but just imagine if purpose was placed at the core of the model of every single law firm in the world, how much access to justice would increase? How many individuals and organizations would still be lacking proper representation? Not many, if you ask me. And this is why I firmly believe that the greatest opportunity to solve some of society's biggest challenges lies in the hands of businesses, and perhaps even more so in the minds of those who will create the next innovative law firms, and even the next Microsofts and Walmarts. Perhaps one day, social entrepreneurship will simply become entrepreneurship. But it will take all of us as entrepreneurs, employees, investors, and even consumers to continue taking a stand in what we build, where we work, and how we spend our money for that to become a reality. Now, I've said it before and I will say it again. The world needs purpose-driven businesses. And now, you know that these businesses aren't just surviving, they're thriving. Thank you. Yes.